Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in and worshiping with us here today virtually. Uh, I want to remind you, make sure you have your Bible in hand, and also if you would please get your communion emblems ready, as we are going to do both of those things today, study God's Word, and uh, also remember our Lord through the emblems that He commanded us to uh, remember Him by. I uh, have some announcements here I want to share with you today, and then we'll move into our prayer time. First thing I want to mention to you today is if you're a secret sister, be sure to have your Christmas gift at the church before next Sunday. Um, next Sunday is the deadline uh, to have those gifts there. They're going to be doing a drive-in gift exchange of some sort, if I understand rightly, but be sure to check the details in your bulletin or on our website at www.burnside.com. Christian.org. Uh, moving into our uh, prayer request time, I want to ask that you'd keep praying for the family of Elizabeth Dixon. Um, her uh, grandfather, John Siegworth, passed away with COVID, and her grandma is still dealing with COVID, so please be praying for them. Also be praying for the family of Kenneth Boyer. Uh, that is Laura Thomas's grandfather. He passed away this last week, and his services were yesterday. So continue to pray for uh, the family, if you would. Also, Nancy uh, Henneke, uh, that's Susan Clymer's sister, is still battling with COVID. As, as are many others, and so please be praying for them as well. And also, if you would be, please be praying for Matt Churchill, our New Connections Minister. Um, he severed the tendon in his left thumb, and that's going to require some surgery, which is going to be taking place this Thursday at 1 p.m. So please be praying for Matt and also Sarah as uh, she is going to be his taxi cab driver and taking care of kids and trying to balance all of that. So uh, please be praying for Matt and Sarah. We have several others of our church family who are still impacted and affected with COVID. Uh, so please be remembering them as well. Uh, also, if you have not had a chance to give your Thanksgiving offering and would like to do so, you can either mail that to the church here at 2088 East County Road, 2110 at Burnside, Illinois, 62330. Or you can hold on to that and give that uh, offering at a time when we are able to gather back together. Um, I think that about does it for um, our announcements and our prayer requests. And in just a moment, I'm going to be praying for us, but we we'll want to uh, encourage you to get ready to have your Bibles open to Malachi chapter 3 is where we're going to be starting here today, Malachi chapter 3, and I'll give you some time to look that up as well. Uh, we have been talking about money, and uh, today we're going to be talking about giving it generously after our communion time, which is going to be brought to us by Jordan Schumann. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then we'll go ahead and continue on with the rest of our service. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for this day. Uh, we recognize it as a day that you have made. And uh, we look forward to worshiping you in our homes with our families drawn close to us. And my prayer here this morning is, Father, that as we do so collectively, uh, even though we are apart, that we would be unified in spirit. And that we would all be focusing on the things that uh, you have blessed us with, the goodness that you've showered upon us. Father, for those in our church family that need you right now more than ever, I pray especially for them. I ask God that you would watch over those who have been affected by death and also those who are struggling with disease, with COVID and uh, with other health problems. Father, I ask that you would just uh, uh, show yourself strong in those situations, Father, that they might see you working, they might trust in your goodness, even when it seems as though you are far away. Remind them, Father, that you are near. Uh, Father, I pray also for Matt and ask God that uh, you let his hand um, uh, feel better and that as he's awaiting surgery, Father, that you'd bring peace and calmness to his mind and into his heart. I pray for a successful surgery, that he would have full use and flexibility of that thumb. And I pray, Father, for, for Sarah, that you would strengthen her and lift her up and, uh, and to help her as she's looking after not only the children, but also Matt during this time, too. Uh, Father, we look forward to opening your word and being reminded about how we can give it generously back to not only you, but to uh, those we are in contact with. And I pray, Father, that through it all, that your name would be lifted high and that your reputation would be made great. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen.
Good morning, church family, and happy belated Thanksgiving. Um, I wanted to take this time of communion to kind of do a couple things. A, I wanted to reflect and also look forward. Um, in doing that, you know, reflecting on Thanksgiving. I know most of us, you know, in some fashion, somehow gathered with family, whether it was on the internet, in person, or various ways. And I know most of us probably discussed things we were thankful for. And that's really important to do and to address and really talk about. But also looking forward, you know, in the next coming weeks, we're running into Christmas and the holiday season. And in that hustle and bustle, we often forget about those things that we were just thankful for a few days ago. And this past week, I took a devotional to the Mem kids. And, and in that devotional at the end, I simply challenged them to serve. And going forward in the next few weeks, you know, are we going to serve others? How do we serve others? I know during this time of COVID and a lot of the things going on, it can be intimidating, difficult. But if we seek these opportunities out to serve, you know, the, the reward is tenfold. And, you know, we, we read in the Bible, especially in John 13, um, Jesus had just got done washing the feet of his disciples. And, you know, even with a little bit of resistance from Simon Peter, you know, Jesus still performed the act of serving. And in John chapter 13, verse 15, he simply says, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. And, you know, that speaks volumes on what Jesus is asking us as Christians to do. Serve. And serve like Christ. You know, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And your relationships with one another have the same, same mindset as Christ Jesus. And I challenge each of us, you know, as we go forward, you know, our, our schedules become hectic. Our lives become a little more hectic with the holiday season upon us, the traveling, the family coming in and out of town. So my challenge to each of us is, you know, do as Christ has done for us. And in, in this time of communion, to tie this all together, you know, looking back and reflecting, but also looking forward and serving, you know, we can see that Christ served each and every one of us, and he performed the ultimate act of service by going to the cross and dying for each of us on, on the cross. Um, so I think during this time, of, you know, during the holidays and during the, the hecticness and the hustle and bustle, pray that each of us finds time to slow down, give thanks, but also find the time to serve others. If you would, please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time of communion where we can come and reflect upon not only our own lives, but the life that you you lived and the ultimate sacrifice that you performed for us. And then I pray that each of us use our talents and our abilities to serve others during this time. And I pray that we all can be a light during this dark time. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, today the title of the message is Money, Give It Generously. Well, this is where I want to start this morning. Jot this thought down, if you would, please. Uh, being generous has very little to do with the amount of money given. 
You understand that? It has very little to do with the amount of money that is given. But instead it has everything to do with the attitude with which you give it. Let me just illustrate it this way. Uh, think about it this way. Think about the big corporation that maybe uh, gets sued and in a civil lawsuit they have to divvy out $40 million. Do they give generously? Well, they gave a lot, but they probably weren't real happy that they had to part money with, with that money, you see. And so there's a difference in giving generously and just giving a lot, okay? And the difference is your attitude. And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later on today as well. Today, however, I want to share with you four life-changing principles, four of them, uh, that will hopefully give you some instructions, some, something to hang your hat on when we're talking about giving generously. And here's the first principle on being generous with your money, on generous giving. Generous giving begins with tithing, okay? So we're in Malachi chapter 3. And uh, we're going to start in verses 6, and we're going to go all the way through verse 8 of Malachi. So follow along if you would, please. For I, the Lord, do not change. I want to stop right here just for a moment. We're not going to get very far before I have to say something about that. But I think it's really important that you understand that sentence, that phrase. I, the Lord, do not change. God does not change. And that's a blessing. That means that his love for you does not change. That means that his grace for you doesn't change. It means that God never has a good day and then a bad day and then a good day and then a bad day. And sometimes he loves you and sometimes he doesn't love you. That's not, God does not change. But if he doesn't change, guess what it also means? It means that his standards, his expectations, his requirements don't change. They're not going to change. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Let me explain what he's talking about here. You know the nation of Israel, they were kind of like bipolar, it almost seemed. Sometimes they were loving God, other times they were rebelling away from God. Well, here, Malachi is chastising them because they had kind of fallen away and were not loving God anymore. And God has a message for Israel. He says, I, the Lord, your God, never change. And it's a good thing I never change. It's a good thing that my love for you remained constant. Why? Because you were not consumed. I could shoot fire down from heaven and just destroy you, but my love for you remains constant. That's what he's saying. Verse 7. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. I want you to see those verses just for a moment and understand that God is a very compassionate, loving God. He's like, he's pleading with them, return to me and I will return to you. He's like, it's not too late for you. And I just want to maybe reiterate that message today, that today is a good day to return to the Lord. Okay? Maybe you've been walking away for a long time. Today's a good day for you to return. And not only just return to the Lord, but also as we're hearing these messages on money, maybe you're thinking, man, I wish I would have heard these messages on money when I was in my 20s or when I was a teenager. Listen, today's a good day to start living these principles of, of how to handle money, how to master your money now. And so whether you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, God's heart for you this weekend is that you would see the future, your future, the remaining days you have left, as an opportunity to conform your life to what God's word would tell you to do. It's not too late. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Now you can't really tell it just by reading it in the text, but the Hebrew makes it very, very uh, plain, very, very obvious that their attitude that, with which they're asking this question, they think they're superior. Psh, how shall we return to you? We're doing everything we should supposed to be doing to you. We're not doing anything wrong. How should we return to you? They're not asking this question with a repentant heart. They're asking it with arrogance. Psh, what do you expect of us, God? We're doing everything we're supposed to do. Now comes the response, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, well, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. 
what I want to do right now is kind of explain what I mean when we're talking about tithing. Because I think maybe tithing is a new concept to some people. You've heard about it. You know, it's kind of an old-fashioned term. You're like, what does it mean? So here we go. Here's eight biblical facts about the tithe. I'm going to leave them up four at a time so you have time to write them down. I would also encourage you to write down the scripture reference because we won't have time to look at all of these verses this morning. Uh, but as you have time this week to study this on your own, um, certainly you can learn what God's word has to say about the tithe. Here's the first principle, or excuse me, the first fact regarding the tithe. First of all, tithe means a tenth. It means 10%. It's used 37 times in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Secondly, it describes the first portion of your gift that is to be given at the immediate opportunity. In other words, uh, whenever you have the first opportunity to give that gift, you're supposed to give it, okay? In Deuteronomy chapter 14, these are great verses, by the way. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 through 29, uh, basically the idea here is, uh, Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. Um, basically what the principle is here in these verses, that if you were out of town and you couldn't make it to, your, uh, to the place of worship at the scheduled time you were supposed to be there, that you were to make provisions to send the tithe on ahead. And the biblical principle is to not have God's money sitting in your checking account when it's due to be given to him. Okay? That's the idea there. All right? Uh, third fact about tithing, it symbol symbolizes God's ownership of everything. It symbolizes God's ownership of everything. Uh, wait a second, Mark. I thought you said that God owns everything. So why am I supposed to give 10%? Why am I supposed to tithe? Well, because it's a symbol, you understand, showing that God does in fact own everything. Okay? Psalm chapter 24 verse 1 simply says that the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The world and all those who dwell in it. And so when you give 10%, you're basically declaring, look God, it's all yours. I'm just the manager of it. It all belongs to you anyway. I'm willing to give back to you what you've asked Okay? Here's the fourth fact about tithing. It's to be off the top. It's to be the first fruits, the best. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first fruits of your produce, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. The idea here is that give God the first, the best. Don't give him the leftovers. Okay? Give to him first. Don't come to the end of, your, of the week and be like, uh-oh, uh, well, this is all I've got left, God, because I've spent everything else on me. Uh, give God first. Give him the best. Here's the fifth principle. It is a universal principle. Tithing is a universal principle. What does that mean? That means that it is for all people at all times. Wait a second, Mark. I thought tithing was an Old Testament principle. The, the New Testament, we're not required to tithe. Well, this is what you need to understand, that tithing was part of the Old Testament law, but it was not the beginning of God's law. You see, the law came, you understand how the law came, right, to the, to the people of, of Israel. It was when uh, Moses led the Egyptian, or Israelites out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. Moses goes up, has a little ch uh, powwow with God, comes back, has the Ten Commandments, presents those to the people. Boom, the law is instituted, okay? There were a lot more laws than those Ten Commandments, by the way, but that were, those were the ones that, that were written out for the people to adhere to. So that's when the law got its existence, okay? But if you look at, and read the book of Genesis, you will discover that it was Abraham who brought tithes to the priest, the high priest Melchizedek. N now, what was the big deal about that? Well, here we have Abraham tithing 400 years before the law came into existence. Tithing is a timeless principle. It is for every man in every age. It was neither instituted by law nor terminated by the age of grace. It was neither given by Moses nor discontinued by Jesus Christ. All right? Here's the sixth principle, sixth fact about it. It can be a thermometer of your spiritual vitality. In other words, your attitude on tithing can be a spiritual thermometer of where you are at in regards to your relationship with Jesus Christ. 
You know, if, if you're like, oh, tithing, I don't want to tithe. I'm not going to tithe. It's not necessary. That can, be a, that can be an indicator of how healthy you are spiritually, okay? Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so if you're not tithing and you, don't, you think, well, I'm not going to tithe. Why would I want? I want to ask you, why not? Why aren't you? Just do a spiritual vitality check on that. Here's the seventh principle. Uh, giving to God his appropriate share honestly is really important to him. It's really important to him. Um, you can read Acts chapter 5 for yourself, but it's a story of a husband and wife by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they lied about their generosity and giving to the Lord, and you know what happened? God struck them dead. He takes it pretty seriously. He takes it pretty seriously, his appropriate share given honestly, okay? Here's the eighth and final fact about it. It's the starting place for New Testament giving, okay? It's the starting place for New Testament giving. 10% should be where you start in your giving. It's a starting place. Now listen, God is a very generous, patient, loving God. And I know some of you aren't quite there in your giving, and that's okay. God's patient with you. He's gracious with you, and we want to extend to you the same grace and love. But please, let me speak truth into your life in this moment. As you read the New Testament, what is less in the New Testament as is compared to the Old Testament? In other words, when we get from the Old Testament to the New Testament, is there anything that, that God's like, okay, you know, we're going to lower the standards on this. In the Old Testament, we're told, don't commit adultery. In the New Testament, we're told, don't lust after a woman in your mind because that is adultery. In the Old Testament, we're told, don't murder. In the New Testament, we're told, hatred is murder. Do you see, time and time again, as we see the Old Testament being re-emphasized in the New Testament, it's always given with a greater standard, okay? And so now we come to giving. What do you think the requirement would be there? What do you think God's expectations would be there? In the Old Testament, we're told 10%, measure it, count it, make sure it's accurate, and then keep the rest. In the New Testament, we're told that everything belongs to God. Manage it wisely and give generously. So you see this, that tithing is where generosity begins. It's kind of like the, the on-ramp to the generosity highway, okay? And it really does sad me, uh, sadden me to, to see people who are kind of crouched at that highway, the and be like, nah, tithing, it's not required. I don't have to do it. I'm not going to do it. And I would say, okay, if that's where you're at, th then don't. Because there is so much in the New Testament that indicates that God is not interested in prying open your kung fu grip hand on money and wealth to take from you. God's not lacking for anything. His kingdom is not lacking for anything. But I want you to understand this point. This, this sermon this morning is, is not an attempt to get something from you. Okay? It's not an attempt to be like, well, as soon as you tithe, I get a raise. You know? It's, it's not that at all. This message is to get you somewhere with God. And tithing is where generosity begins. And if you're missing out on giving generously and the blessing that comes as a result of that, well, then I, I really truly feel bad for you because you've missed the boat on giving. But if you're going to get in the car and you'll let God drive it, he's going to take you to where you need to be. And eventually, I'm confident in this, if you surrender your, your finances to the Lord, he's going to get you to the 10%. He's going to get you to 12%. Okay? Well, let's talk a little bit now about New Testament principles on giving. There's five of these. What does the Bible in the New Testament have to say about giving? Well, first of all, we are to give on the Lord's Day. Did you know this? 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says, On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and to save as he prospers. You know, that's why we take up an offering every Sunday. Did you guys know that? Because it's biblical. It's in the Bible. The Bible demonstrates that that's what we're supposed to do. Secondly, you are to give as unto the Lord. That when you give money, you're supposed, to give, you're supposed to give that money as if you're giving it to the Lord. You know, don't give to a church. I hope you don't give. Well, I like Burnside Christian Church. I'm going to give to that church. I hope you know this, but when you give money to our church, you are giving to the Lord. And I hope you understand that. 
and it's so important. And on the opposite side of that, some people are thinking, well, I'm going to punish the church because I don't like what they're doing over there. I'm going to withhold my money and not give them a dime. And I got to tell you, you're not withholding from the church, okay? You're withholding from God. Give as unto the Lord. Third principle, give as the Lord has prospered you. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, as abundance in increases, so should your giving. Here's the fourth fact. Uh, give sacrificially. In Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, Jesus is watching as people are putting money into the temple offering plates. And he notices there's this widow. And something very miraculous, something very interesting happens there. She's giving, and she gives all that she has. She, doesn't, she can't afford much. She puts what amounts to just a few dollars into the plate, a few pennies. And there's other people who are going by, and they're putting tons of money in there. And Jesus says, man, that woman, she's blessed. She's blessed because she gave sacrificially. If you give to the Lord only after you have everything that you've ever wanted in this life, well, then that's too late. Give to the Lord sacrificially. Here's the fifth fact, and we're going to talk more about this, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but give cheerfully. Give cheerfully. Generous giving begins with tithing. That's the first principle about generosity. Here's the second principle on generosity. Are you ready? Generous giving tests my faith. You see, when, when you give generously, it is, it is proof that you trust God, that you have faith in God, that he's going to take care and provide for your needs. And I know for some of you, you don't have enough peanut butter to cover the bread. I know that. In other words, there are too many bills and not enough income. And so how can you possibly do without 10% when there's already not enough income? Look, when you tithe, it tests your faith. You're acknowledging, you're trusting that God's going to meet your needs. You're acknowledging that 90% that plus God is way more than 100% of my own. You're trusting that God's provision is satisfactory for your life. We're going to continue now in our text in Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 8 again. Will, you rob, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be found food in my house. I want to pause right here and just kind of touch on a couple of words here. See, God is commanding that the tithes be brought into his house. Uh, this was for worship, of course. We're going to honor God with what we have, but it was also for practical reasons as well. In Nehemiah chapter 10, spend some time reading Nehemiah chapter 10 this week. Very interesting, very enlightening. It's recorded in Nehemiah chapter 10 that the temple, in the temple, there were chambers uh, that were made to receive the tithes that were given. Because people would give one-tenth of their flocks. People would give uh, one-tenth of their wood supply to help the priests burn the altars. Uh, they would give one-tenth of their grain, one-tenth of their flour, one-tenth of their money. It's also recorded that part of the gifts that were given were there to help the priests meet the needs of the priests. Those who were actively serving and ministering, that part of that gift that was given was used to supply their and meet their needs. But something else that I thought was interesting, in Nehemiah chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, part of the gifts that were given were given to help, meet, uh, to help with the upkeep Did you know that? That's a biblical thing. And here's what I understand the Bible to teach in these three verses, okay? The tithes that you're asked to give should be given to the local church where you worship. If you want to support a ministry outside of the local church, that should be done with your offerings above and beyond the 10%. Now, now you may have noticed that week after week, Right before our offering meditation, right before we, we talk about offering, there's a slide that is shown on our screen. Watch and notice it this week. It says, this time of offering is for our regular members. If you're visiting here, we don't expect you to give. You know why that is? 
That's because we expect the members of this body of Christ to contribute to the needs of the ministry of this body. Is that clear? Back to verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. What God is saying here is test me. Test me and see. Be faithful with your tithe and see if I'm not faithful to you. We've talked on this before too, but I want to clear it up again. Uh, you know, it seems like the Bible would contradict itself because here God's saying, test me. In other places, Jesus tells us, don't put the Lord your God to the test. He says that in, in, in Matthew chapter uh, 4, I believe, when he's being tempted in the desert. So which is it? Test God or don't test God? Well, here, this should help. Don't test God unless he tells you to test him. Okay? Don't test God unless he tells you to. And here God is telling you, test him. And this verse is truly amazing. Verse 10 is really amazing. Why is it amazing? Well, it's because it's God's challenge. And to my knowledge, this is the only place in Scripture where God himself says, go ahead, I dare you, try it. God's like, what? You don't think I'm good? You don't think I'm faithful? You don't think that I will provide for your needs? You don't think that I see how much you have? And God's like, test me in this. Be faithful to me with your tithes. And I will show you just how faithful I am to you. And so I want to issue the formal, formal challenge of God to this body of believers here at Burnside Christian Church. I want to challenge you to increase your giving. And for some, that may mean to start tithing. For others, that may mean to give above and beyond the 10% that you already. Try it and see. Test me in this and see. You're not going to know until you try. I want you to test God's goodness in this promise. And so what I want to do is I want to challenge us to do this for the next seven weeks. Seven weeks? Why seven weeks? Well, seven is a good number. It's a biblical number. It's a number of completion. It's a number of perfection. And also... Seven weeks will take us into the new year, okay? But I want us to commit to this. I want to challenge you to commit to do what God has asked you to do. Test him in this and see. See if his goodness isn't, isn't overwhelming to you. Generous giving starts with tithing. Generous giving tests my faith. Yeah, it will test your faith because Christmas is coming. There's gifts to buy. What am I supposed to do, Mark? Oh, listen, it will test your faith. It will stretch you a bit. It's intense, but it's meant to spur you on in your faith of God. That's why money is so important to God. It shows that you trust him with everything. You're not putting your faith in your savings account. You're trusting him to meet your needs. Well, now we're going to come to the second scripture we're going to use today. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Go ahead and flip to the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 is where we're going to spend the rest of our time today. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 6. And while you're turning there, I want to give you the third principle in generous giving. Generous giving is a personal decision. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> Here in this passage, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is encouraging the church in Corinth to take up a special offering to help provide for the needs of his missional ministry. He's a missionary. He needs money. He can't do it on his own. So he's writing the churches and requesting that they take up an offering on his behalf. And now we come to verses 6 and 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And this is what Paul says to them. He says to them, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's start here. Giving to God isn't a chore. Okay? Let your offering, let your gift, let your tithe be an offering of, of, of gratitude. A sign of appreciation for what God has done for you in your life. Uh, next month, Lindsay, my wife Lindsay and I will have been married for 16 years. 
And uh, that means that we've spent a lot of time together, a lot of birthdays, a lot of anniversaries, Valentine's Day, Christmases. Uh, you know how many times in all of our years together I purchased her one of these for her gift, for her present, for Christmas? I can count on one hand uh, the number of times I purchased a frying pan for my wife. This many times. Is that wisdom, ladies? Amen, if that's wisdom. Amen. Amen. Guys, you know why that's wisdom? Because if I was to give this to my wife, cooking is a chore. Cooking is a responsibility. It's a duty trying to figure out what I got to feed you now, you know, and I got to make something for you to, to feed your, your face, right? It's a chore. It's an obligation. And um, listen, giving to God is not an obligation or a chore, okay? If that's what you've made it, if that's what it's become to you, I've got to write the check for the offering this week. Listen, um, giving isn't supposed to flow to or from obligation. It's not supposed to flow out of obligation. If I'm giving you a gift because I have to give you a gift, is it really a gift? How many of us would consider our taxes that we have to pay a gift to the government? Is that a gift? That's an obligation. And some of us have been putting frying pans in the offering plate week after week. Well, here's a gift. Here's an obligation. Here's a chore. Something, God, that you can do for me. Bless me. And giving should not be that. Giving should not be a chore. It should be done cheerfully, gladly. Listen, God um, has asked for us each to give. But... It's a personal decision. He says, decide in your heart. You know, I believe that's why it's not said, hey, in the New Testament, give 10%, give 10%, give 10%. Because, listen, think about it in this, these terms. When God was dealing with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, when he started his whole uh, plan of salvation for the world, he was dealing with infants who were following after him, right? Well, what do you do with a child? You set very strict parameters for them. You do this at this particular time right? Well, as that relationship with God has now matured over the time, as he's kind of given us freedom in Christ, he's not commanding that you give 10% anymore. He's like, it's up to you. It's up to you. You decide in your heart how much to give. Now, I do believe God expects at least 10%, okay? I don't think we see that God's all of a sudden like, oh, you know, whatever. God expects, I believe, at least what he had for the Old Testament principles in the Old Testament. All right? But it's up to you to decide. And because some have turned giving into an obligation, you're not doing it cheerfully. You're not doing it with joy. And so I have to tell you this morning to purpose it in your heart before you ever walk through the doors. How much am I going to give to God this week? 10% is the model, but if you've purposed in your heart that we're going to give 8.5%, and Lord, that's going to be a challenge for me, but Lord, we're, we're going to give that. Well, then get that out to God's house. Let it be your decision. Let it be your offering of glad gratitude. It's a personal decision. And some people have also looked at giving as, you know, like another bill, another monthly bill that's due. God isn't the landlord uh, demanding the rent. God isn't Amron threatening to cut you off if you don't pay your bill to him. That's not God. You know, um, one of the things I love that we've done here, and I know some of you have really struggled with it, but I'm going to tell you I love it, our offering boxes that we've instituted around the auditorium. I love it. Um, you know, it used to be, the way offering was, was taken here, was a plate was passed in front of you. And if you forgot, or maybe you'd feel guilty because the ushers were like looking at you, so you'd scrounge through your wallet, and you'd be like, okay, I'll give this this week. That's not giving purposefully. That's not giving, that's giving um, begrudgingly, okay? That's being, uh, giving because you, you feel like you've been manipulated in some ways. And God doesn't want that. He wants you to decide in your heart how much you're going to give. And so with our offering boxes, not only do you have to, you get to decide, there's no pressure on you to give, okay? It's between you and the Lord as it should be, but it's also, you have to give purposefully, don't you? And I know it's been neat to see some of you guys walk out of here and you're like, oh, I forgot to give my money. And you've got to come back in and you've got to give it purposefully. You've got to give it intentionally. You've decided in your heart, this is the Lord's. I'm going to give it to him. And I want to make sure he gets it. And I so appreciate that. What we're talking about here is the attitude with which you give. And in our text, it describes the attitude with which you are to give. It's, Paul says, give cheerfully. 
God loves a cheerful giver. Not someone who, who doesn't want to give. And a lot could be said on this point alone, but generous giving, it's a, it's a personal decision. Here's the last principle. Uh, generous giving is abundantly blessed. Generous giving is abundantly blessed. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 through 15. You know, time and time again, all throughout God's word, uh, this, this promise of God providing and blessing is, is included with instructions on giving. God's going to bless the giver. That is what it says, okay? But here's a problem. The problem within the church is that we are quick to shy away from this point because TV evangelists in their shiny suits and their extravagant jet planes have tainted your view of giving theology. And TV evangelists are all the time saying, give generously to this ministry. God wants to make you rich. And what they're really saying is give to this ministry so I can get rich. That's what they're saying. Just so you know, we, we here at Burnside Christian Church don't believe in health and wealth. Uh, we don't believe that God wants every individual to be rich and that you're going to get rich by giving to God, that he's going to give you abundantly money and you're going to have money flowing out your ears. And so that doesn't, that, that's not what we believe in practice here. But we do believe God's word when he says that he will bless the giver, okay? He is going to bless the giver. And yes, it's going to be financial blessing in some cases, not every case, but they come in different shapes as well. We're going to read through these verses, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 through 15, you're going to see three blessings God promises to give to those who give generously. Okay? You know, before prayer time, a lot of times people have prayed, God bless the gift and the giver. Well, now we're on it. We're going to talk about how God blesses the giver. Okay? Verse 10, God's going to bless you financially in some cases. It says in verse 10 that God will supply and multiply your seed for sowing. Seed here represents what you have given. And so the first return, the lowest return, the lowest, I believe, blessing that God gives is to give you more money. One of the ways that God blesses is by giving you more. That's, that's what scripture would teach. Not every single time. Not so that you can get rich. That's not your motivation for giving. But here's the second way that God blesses generosity. And that's through abundant righteousness. Abundant righteousness. Paul goes on to say in verse 10, he's going to give you seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. That God's going to give you the ability to do what is right. Wow, what a blessing to those who give generously. What if a sin could be overcome? What if an addiction could be broken? And if in your generosity, God would miraculously release you from the temptation or that anxiety abundant righteousness. You can have the money. You can have the, the, the abundant blessing that God's going to give you money. I'll take that abundant righteousness each and every time. That's my pick. I'll take door number two. But Paul mentions a third blessing of the generous giver, and it's abundant ministry. Verses 11 and 12. You will be enriched in everything for all your liberality, that means generosity, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. You see, when you give generously, because of generous givers, God blesses ministry. Lives are touched, people are changed. God is using those tools to impact lives for his kingdom. I hope this morning you've got a better grasp on what it means to give generously. I hope you haven't feel, felt manipulated today. I hope you've just felt like we've been walking through God's word to see what he would say. Generous giving begins with tithing. Generous giving tests my faith. Generous giving is a personal decision. Generous giving is abundantly blessed. Let's just uh, stand up together and we're going to pray. And then we'll have our time decision. Let's pray. God, again, I don't know how many times we can say it, but, but thank you. And may we never grow tired of saying it. Thank you, God, for the things you've given to us, for the blessings you pour out, God. Your generosity has been proven time and time again. And so, Lord, I don't know why sometimes we, we doubt it, why sometimes we, we hold so tightly onto things, fearing that we won't have enough. And, and so, God, I just ask that you would reassure us today. Remind us of the promises you've set forth in your word. 
God, I thank you for the generosity of so many here at this church. I'm thankful for the lessons that I've learned from those people and those individuals who have just been so generous. And God, I have a long way to go too. But I pray that as we as a church that we would take those steps to, to become more generous in our giving. Thank you for blessing us with what we have. God, forgive us for not using it for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you again for tuning in with us today. And man, I uh, hope that you've been blessed by studying God's Word today. But I also hope that you've been challenged a little bit to examine your finances and to see how you and your family can uh, give it back to God more generously, that you might expand His kingdom uh, deeper and greater. And uh, starting next week and all throughout the month of December, we're going to be doing and uh, having giving you an opportunity really uh, to participate in giving it generously back. And one of the ways that we thought uh, th this might be effective is by doing what's called pay it forward. Many of you have heard this concept before. It's the idea that uh, you uh, are maybe in a drive-in. Uh, uh, drive through at a, a restaurant and you pay for the car behind you or maybe you're at the gas station and you're in line and, and you see the guy in front of you and you want to pay for maybe his coffee or something or candy bar or whatever it may be. Um, just want to encourage you through the month of December to do that and uh, next week we're going to have a business card uh, type cards made up that'll have our church name and our logo on there and our address and website and with a little saying on there something to the effect of the reason that I'm paying for this for you is because he paid for it for me. And of course, that's referring to Jesus, something along those lines. Anyway, if you would like to participate in that, there's going to be packs of five of those that are going to be uh, contained together, maybe in envelopes, maybe they'll be with uh, paper clips, but those will be available in the fellowship hall starting next Sunday. And uh, looking forward to hearing the stories about how you have been give, able to give it generously uh, to the people in your community. That we, our desire is that through the, our generosity and through our love that others might see Jesus in us. That that might open the door for us to share with them um, the story of how a God who loved us enough to send His Son to die for us on the cross. And what better time to do that than Christmas time when the world celebrates the arrival of the uh, newborn King born to the Virgin Mary. And uh, we're looking forward to not only celebrating Christmas with you, but hearing the stories of how you were able to pay it forward this Christmas season. Have a great week, you guys.